your chili uh, to the cook-off, we ask that you please let Jackie know uh, so that he can best prepare uh, for that evening. But that's on January 27, 5 o'clock. The second thing that is on the calendar that we want to highlight for you uh, is our prayer, praise, and potluck on the 21st. 5 o'clock, we'll gather over the Family Life Center, enjoy a meal, and then we're going to spend some time praying and praising. Um, and so we, that's a corporate, church-wide opportunity for you to come and pray, to seek the Lord's face, uh, to ask for His favor as we want to be about doing what uh, God wants us to do. So those are two opportunities I want to make you aware of. I hope that you'll be at both of them uh, coming up. Would you read uh, this scripture from Daniel chapter 2 along with me? Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we ask of you, for you have made known to us the King's matter.
Uh, we were made to know God, to glorify God, um, and made, to, made for God and to know his glory. Um, so God was glorified through all that we did at Summit. It was a long list that I won't share because it would take forever. It would take a weekend. Um, but again, thank you so much for sending me. Thank you so much for being in prayer with me. Uh, it was a great time. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Our state convention not only has um, prepared an event like that for young people like Troy, they've also prepared for us this year what they're calling 52 Sundays, 52 cent ones uh, from South Carolina that have gone, uh, whether it's uh, up the street or around the world. And so this year we're going to commit as a church to do our best to uh, every Sunday uh, pray for one of those sent ones. And so the state has it kind of mapped out. And so this week um, we have the Mangrum family. You can see their picture there. Uh, JD, Natalie, Owen, and Noah uh, are serving in uh, Charlestown, part of um, around Boston. It's a suburb of Boston. And so they've come out of Greenville, uh, a church there sent them uh, to this area. And so a couple of requests that they had for us. Number one, pray for the main room staff, continued favor and serving presence in their neighborhood. So opportunities, you know, in an area where uh, there was so much, there was rich uh, doctrine, there was rich hope in Christ, uh, now is dark and bleak. And so I'm grateful for folks like the Mangrums who get to uh, go into these dark places. Uh, and so they're asking us to pray for them in such a way that they would have a presence in their neighborhood. And we're going to talk about that from Daniel in a little while. Um, but they would have such a presence uh, that others would see the gospel in them. Be, the, the glory of God would be so radiant in their lives uh, that uh, he would be interested to ask questions. Number two, pray for salvation for the Mangrum's neighbors. So that presence uh, isn't just to be a good neighbor. That presence is to be a good neighbor in such a way that they get to have gospel conversations like Troy was talking about. Uh, it's good to be good neighbors, but that's not an end uh, in of itself. We got to take being a good neighbor and, and point people to the gospel. And so that's their second prayer request. Number three, they're looking for a church planting resident uh, to join them in uh, 2024. They say the goal of this resident would be to eventually be sent out to plant a church in an adjacent neighborhood. Just so you know, in one square mile of where the main rooms live, there's 19,000 people. Um, so very concentrated. Uh, it's not this, you know, that's not quite as concentrated necessarily as some places overseas, uh, but uh, they are praying about this planter to come and raise him up, train him, prepare him, send him out to an adjacent neighborhood. So would you pray uh, with them about that? And finally, uh, we're asked to pray for Noah and Owen to have Christian friends. So you can imagine as a family that's, that's new to an area that you look like, I don't know, I'm terrible with ages, but I'd say 12 and nine. They look about 12 and nine. And so 12 and nine year olds don't always have a hard time finding friends. Um, but moving to a new area, moving to a whole new um, culture in a sense, uh, would be hard. And so they're asking that we pray for those needs as well for them. So I'm going to pray out loud if you would pray where you are. Maybe one of those specific things just kind of resonates with you. Maybe you're a 9 or 12 year old in here. Then I ask you to pray that they would find Christian friends. Um, maybe you're living in a neighborhood sort of like probably not as concentrated as theirs, uh, but you see opportunities for gospel engagement in your neighborhood. Pray about that. And as you do, remember J.D. and Natalie. Father, I thank you for the ministry of the Mangrums, and I thank you for the church in Greenville that sent them out. That had a passion, God, for the lost in the Boston Metroplex, And I pray that as um, they seek a new planter to come and join them in residency, that you would maybe even today set that burden on a man, set that burden on his family, that maybe today they would go and, and say, I want to be a part of what God's doing in Charlestown. 
I thank you for their desire to be a meaningful presence in their neighborhood. Not just good neighbors that lend out eggs and sugar and butter, but good neighbors who can point them to the hope of Christ. God, I pray for Oa, Owen and Noah. I pray that you might help them find meaningful friendships. That they too would be able to speak about the hope of Christ. Father, today I thank you for the opportunity to pray for those who are hurting in our church family. I pray for the Jordan family. I ask that you might be near to them, comfort them, help them in their preparations for Mr. Willard's service later this week. Pray for Ms. Thelma, God, that you would give her strength, remind her that it's your breath in her lungs. She might be able to continue to know your kindness, your strength. Right, for Miss Anna, as she's recovering, I ask that you would continue to be near to her. Restore her, please. Thank you for the care that you've given to Mr. Herndon, Ms. Cameron. God, I pray that you continue to strengthen their bodies. Father, as we open your word today, I pray that we be faithful to engage your word in such a way that we see your spirit in every word in the pages of our text today. Spirit, if there is anything in here that would hinder our engagement with that text, I pray that you would remove it now. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Go ahead, if you would, if you have your copy of God's Word, to turn to the uh, book of Daniel, the last of the five major prophets. Opportunity to take an honest evaluation of our lives. Opportunity to ask ourselves some thoughtful questions about how we intend to live going forward. Change is often necessary coming out of those questions that we communicate sometimes in the form of resolution. We talk about New Year's resolutions. A, a resolution is simply a declaration of intention. It's not an oath. It's just a declaration. I intend to do this. An opportunity for those who are in Christ. Opportunity to make some adjustments possibly to how faithful we are to the Lord. Make the adjustments where we might see those necessary. Statistics actually tell us that the majority of people who made New Year's resolutions in January have stopped working on that particular change by the time spring rolls around. Now, don't let that discourage you, uh, but that is what statistics tell us. It's true that there may be a few milestone events in our lives that uh, affect completely the trajectory of our lives, but mostly, as Paul David Tripp speaks about just this past week in his devotion, we mostly exist in the thousands of little moments that fill our ordinary lives. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, so we don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. So day by day by day, we seek the Spirit's help to submit our hearts to the little moments that God uses to seek to sanctify us. And in those little moments, that sanctification is to make us more and more into the image of His Son. Now, the change happening to us in sanctification is not a burden to bear. It's actually a good gift to celebrate. Yes, some of that grace shaping will happen in some very difficult seasons of our lives, but the fruitful work that comes out of that is that the unwholesome and potentially dangerous things are put to death while healthy God-honoring things grow and thrive. We discover that the things of earth start to grow strangely dim. 
the idols of the world that we've sought, the worldly passions that we've clung to, they disappear in the light of Christ's glory and grace. Through the journey of sanctification, our heart's allegiance actually turns more and more to our Redeemer and His kingdom. We find ourselves looking back, longing for the past with far fewer glances. And instead choosing to fix our eyes on the glorious future that is available for those who are in Christ with our true King. You see, God is always at work pruning and preparing His people for His glory. Even going back to Old Testament times, even God's chosen people, the Israelites, needed His continual small grace change in their lives. We know they often found themselves looking back, looking back, wishing, oh, I wish we could go back there, looking back to what they once had, often wanting to look like the world. Even though the one true God had revealed himself to them, made known to them their missionary assignment. What was that assignment? It's just what the Mamers are asking for as well. The assignment was to live in such a way. This was their assignment. It really wasn't that complicated. You read Leviticus, you might think otherwise, but, but it really wasn't supposed to be that complicated. It was supposed to be, you live in such a way that the surrounding nations would come to know and worship Yahweh as king. Their clothing choices, their food choices, their cleanliness, their continual sacrifices, all had the unique purpose of pointing the world to see Yahweh as supreme. All they had to do was obey. To have no other gods before him. They failed miserably in that task most of the time. Choosing to look like the nations around them instead of holding before those unrighteous neighbors the high honor of being a display of the goodness of God. And so their refusal to honor God as supreme in their lives meant displacement. It meant exile, forced deportation to a land unlike their own. And God told them to it's not like it just happened. Like, oh, what? Where did God go? God said, if, then. And God kept his word. So today, we begin a journey into the book of Daniel. Choosing this morning to sort of take the 30,000 foot view of this prophetic book before we zero in on the individual chapters in the weeks ahead. Most of the time, if you're our guest here today, most of the time, we work through God's word verse by verse. Today's overview is just a little bit different. It's an opportunity for us to whet our appetites for what's ahead. Our aim in this new sermon series is to increase our understanding of our great king and consider well his coming kingdom. And so to assist you in your study of this book, you should have found when you came in today a little, you know, five and a half, whatever size paper, eight and a half by five and a half sheet of paper near you. Uh, if you didn't, we have some copies back there in the connection corner that you can pick up on your way out. I, I'm not, don't worry, today's sermon is not just an overview of that. I know you can read that yourself. But that was meant to increase your understanding so that we're walking through this. We're wanting to go deeper. We're trying to provide you with the resources that you need. So on that paper, you'll find kind of an introductory statement. You'll find kind of the, the theme and the purpose and then you'll find a rough outline of each of the chapters. And we're not going to just go through chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3 like that. that that's, so that's not our preaching schedule on that paper. But it does give you an idea of what the book looks like. So I hope that you will use that, tuck it away in your Bible, use it as a reference as we go through this journey. The book of Daniel contains some of the most fascinating stories of God's sovereign rule over human affairs. If you've grown up in church or you've had any exposure to children's Bible teaching material in the past, you're very familiar with the historical narratives in this book. Things like fiery furnaces, things like handwriting on the wall, even a lion's den. Yet each of those stories were given to us for something far greater 
than the potential made-for-the-big-screen kind of presentation. Daniel offers the readers of his day, and even us today, the opportunity to observe what it means to remain faithful in a world that rejects the truth of God. Is it worth standing up and obeying a God whose kingdom seems so far away? Can we be a blessing to the nations where God has placed us, even while our understanding of the world and everything in it is often directly opposed to the cultural influencers? You see, those are important questions. Because we live in a day where we are misunderstood, we are maligned, we are often mistreated because of our fidelity to biblical truth. Daniel found himself being forced to consider those same questions in his day. There's so much for us to learn in the pages that he wrote by the Holy Spirit's inspiration. So I want us to lay a strong foundation by considering some of the background information about the time in which Daniel wrote. Daniel was a real man. Not a myth or a legend. You say, what, what's the big deal? Why do you say that? Well, because modern scholarship that denies the supernatural would say that there's no way that a man could do and experience and go through what Daniel did. And so we can just make it a good story. We can make it seem like it, it was just it was just to encourage them. Oh, this guy named Daniel, look at all that he did. Oh, you know, he was a real man. Jesus said so himself. So there is some debate, however, about when he wrote it. Most scholars would say that we can date the entire book basically to the 6th century B.C. Now, Daniel's messages were addressed to different audiences at different times. Except for his final vision, we can assume that Daniel originally addressed all of his messages to Israel in exile before a remnant returned to the promised land in 538 B.C. Why? Well, they need to be reassured that God was still in control, even in evil empires, and that God was going to bring his people to the promised land and one day establish an everlasting kingdom, his everlasting kingdom. And so over the course of Daniel's book, over four major world empires are dealt with. You have Babylonia, you have Medo-Persia, you have Greece, especially Egypt and Syria, and you have Rome. Now, the first six chapters of this book are narratives. They're about Daniel and his friends who were taken to Babylon. So if you have your copy of God's Word, go ahead and open Daniel 1. You're probably already there. Thank you. We'll look. Daniel chapter 1. We're we'll look in verse 3. Or begin there. <laughs> Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them the daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank, they were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. Now the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel, he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah, he called Shadrach. Mishael, he called Meshach. And Azariah, he called Abednego. So Daniel's story is really set against the backdrop of this splendor of a Babylonian uh, renaissance. Uh, that renaissance was under the leadership of King Nebuchadnezzar. We'll just call him King Neb for short, if you don't mind. I know Jacob's really big into King Nebuchadnezzar, and so I'm going to call him King Neb, Jacob. I hope that doesn't mess you up too much uh, in your studies, just as you come to present this in a few weeks, what God's done uh, through him and what God's doing to use him. Uh, but King Neb isn't just famous because his name's in the Bible. Right? He was one of the most important figures in revitalizing the thousand-year-old Babylonian empire that had been declining for centuries. He expanded his territory as country after country fell under his military might. King Neb was also a culture warrior. 
He cared about rebuilding great cities. He used the wealth that he would gain from the conquered nations to finance his own rebuilding projects. We get a taste of his pride. Look over at chapter 4. Get a little taste of his pride. Chapter 4, verse 30. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power, as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? Wow, that just drips with arrogance. And, and, and while this arrogance is certainly going to be addressed by God, archaeologists have discovered that King Neb had transformed Babylon into the greatest city of the ancient world. So not only was he expanding his territory, making this great kingdom, not only was he revitalizing culture, he also wanted to reinvigorate the religion of the Babylonians. So as the military conquered nations, they assumed in their wrongful thinking that their gods must be superior to the gods of the nations that they conquered. And so they would carry the articles used, by, used for worship by those conquered peoples and place them in their temples as a way of claiming that their gods were victorious. Let's go back to chapter 1. Let's see. There's a lot of footnotes in there. Sorry. Like we said, overview. Chapter 1, verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. So the deeper we get into Daniel, we come to discover that as powerful as King Neb was, he didn't stay in power forever. After a spectacular 43-year reign, King Neb died and was succeeded by other rulers. He did not stay in power all that time. King Neb died. He was succeeded by others, some of whom Daniel mentions in his book. Even some of the most powerful kings who had some amazing resources to build elaborate kingdoms seem to have a sign that hangs over their heads that says, this too shall pass. What an encouragement that must have been to the exiles. <clears throat> their God was being mocked. Their land was laid waste, but their God was still on the throne, even as the mighty, ruthless rulers came and went. <clears throat> Friends, it's a good reminder to us that we must not be entranced by our own achievements and authority. No matter how much authority we may possess in this world, we must not be deceived. The book of Daniel confronts us with the truth that the power that we exercise did not come from us, and it's not something we can keep. God lifts up and God puts down. If we're tempted to want to wield great power in this world, we need to keep in mind the passing nature of power and the judgment from God for those who seek power for their own sake. What we want is a better indicator of who we are than what we have. And so let's be careful not to seek things for ourselves. Greatness and power seem to come after men like Joseph in Egypt or Daniel in Babylon. But they didn't seek it. Daniel models for us humble acknowledgement of where true power lies, as we'll see when we get to chapter 2. Now it would be appropriate to give these first six chapters of Daniel, the name or the title, At Home in Babylon. You see, for in this section, the first readers, and even us today, learn how to be at home in this present world. This is good news for God's suffering people. But when you get to chapter 7, everything changes. Chapter 7 is the hinge upon which the book kind of breaks in half. The rest of the book deals with visions of the future. So we shift from historical narrative to apocalyptic literature. Now that word, whoo, that gets people all excited. Apocalypse. Um, I found this definition helpful. Apocalyptic literature is intended to interpret present earthly circumstances in light of the supernatural world and of the future. <laughs> 
and to influence both the understanding and the behavior of the audience by means of divine authority. Now that's a book definition. Listen to what Thomas Long had to say. I, and listen to his picture. He's painting us a picture. I think it's really beautiful of this form of literature and the gold. Thomas says, apocalyptic literature draws back the curtains. You can imagine that. Drawing back the curtains and allows the reader to see the eschatological, in other words, the last things, the end times, the eschatological victory of God, which has already been achieved over whatever forces are, even at that moment, crippling the community of faith. It's like a 9-11 or 9-1-1 genre for times of emergency. So we don't have to look at apocalyptic literature and say, oh, that's too hard. I'm not going to mess with that. It is hard. Very hard because the symbols and, and, and some of the things that he points to aren't that easy to, to, to understand. But we're going to unpack it together by the power of the Holy Spirit. Consider the kindness of God. God's people during Daniel's writing were under the power of ruthless tyrants. No land, no temple, no king. And yet in that great suffering, God pulls back the curtain. <laughs> And he shows his people in very vivid ways what's ahead. Most of us do like to know what's coming. Many of you probably checked the weather app today to see how the weather was going to be. You needed to know how to dress. You needed to know what shoes to put on. If it was raining like yesterday, you needed to know that. We understand that. We want to be able to plan. Plan hikes outside. Plan picnics. Plan play dates. Plan trips. We've got to watch the weather. We appreciate our maps app when we're going somewhere telling us, oh, there's an accident ahead. Go a different way. I appreciate that. I know how to get to Columbia. But I actually turn the app on now so that in case there's a wreck, I can go around it. So I like to know that. We like knowing we're 10th in the queue when we're on hold in customer service somewhere. You know, we appreciate that. You're number 10, you know, we'll get to you when we get to you. Okay, great. We like to know that. And so, but, but apocalyptic literature isn't given to us so that we can map out God's plan for the future and put it on some calendar and leave it for the next generation so that they can sell everything and wait around for God to come back next. It's given to us so that, despite potential appearances, we can rest confidently knowing God is still on the throne. That's what it's here for. The future firmly in his hand. So God gives us those visions, pulls back the curtains. You might be going through something really hard, but here's what's coming. That's what apocalyptic literature does. Three things, three main things that that future is given to us from prophecy in Daniel. I want us to consider those three things, all right? They'll, they'll come up again as we go along. They're repeated throughout. He prophesies the first coming of the Messiah. That's thing number one, first coming of the Messiah. The second thing is the coming of Antiochus Epiphanes. And the, th and the third thing is the second coming of the Messiah. So you've got Messiah's first coming, Antiochus is coming, and the coming of the Messiah again. And so each of the prophecies relates to those three things. Both times the Messiah enters our world, it will be preceded by a severe time of persecution for God's people. I know that to have been true about his first coming, for sure. A good summary statement for this second half, okay, at home in Babylon, chapters 1 through 6, chapter 7 through 12, a great summary statement, getting home from Babylon. At home, getting home. At home, getting home. Daniel's visions helped God's people see that their longing to have their exilic condition removed was going to come with great cost. Things weren't going to be easy. Even after seven years of exile, Daniel says 70 sets of seven remain for God to accomplish his kingdom work. Salvation was far more than hitching their wagons and getting back to Jerusalem. Because for some of them, that's what they felt this was all about. If we could just get back to the promised land, it'll all be okay. The salvation that Daniel was pointing to was more than geography. The real deliverance that God was planning was going to require greater difficulty for God's people and his anointed. Check out Isaiah 53 if you want to see about the anointed, the difficulty that went, that happened to God's son. Daniel was offering a hope 
that while getting back is good, it's not the ultimate that God is aiming for. It's not the complete deliverance that God's offering. For that, God would need to come back and offer his life as a way to come take his people back home. To come first, I should say. To offer a way to bring his people home. Daniel's visions, though, didn't make it that clear. But his promise of a king and a kingdom were clear. Getting home from Babylon required a sovereign God. That while all the kings and kingdoms may have changed around them, God never changed. God loves his people and cares about their continued holiness. Now, Daniel gets to the end of the book and admits that he doesn't understand. He really would like to know the outcome of what's been revealed, so flip over to chapter 12. I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, oh my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? All right, so he's seen this, this is the end. Visions have been given now. And he's admitting, I don't understand this. Look at the Lord's reply in verse nine. He said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. God's saying he wasn't going to give any more prophecy to Daniel about the future, and he wasn't going to explain any more until the time of the end. Well, Peter starts preaching about the time of the end. He uses the words last days when he's preaching as the Holy Spirit at Pentecost is being poured out on people. So you see what's happening? The Apostle John writes about this interesting event in heaven described in Revelation. So go there. Revelation chapter 5, please. Revelation chapter 5, when we just see this. So, so Daniel said, I don't understand. God says, seal it up until the last time. To the last days, right? Look what John sees. Revelation 5. Then I saw, this is John, I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. We just talked about something being sealed up. Seal it up. Now John's, gives, there's a scroll. In the hand, what's happening? It's sealed up. <clears throat> Verse 2, I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seal? It's been sealed up, Daniel said. God told Daniel, seal it up, Daniel. I'm not going to explain all this. John said, so the mighty angel, who's worthy? Verse 3, no one in heaven or, and, or, excuse me, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. Okay? This, this is a problem. We created a problem. Four. And I began to weep loudly. John. John talking here. I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Daniel, seal it up. John gets his vision. Verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So here, John's weeping. The, seal, the, the scroll is sealed up. It appears nobody can open it. And, and yet, what? The elders say, John, don't weep anymore. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he's conquered. He can open the scroll and its seven seals. And when he does, when he starts to do it, the prophecies of Revelation 6 through 22 are revealed. <coughs> but we discover a greater unveiling of the mysteries Daniel was asking about. I don't understand God. And then John gets this vision. And what, what we find there is these are some of the mysteries Daniel was asking about. But we also get some new prophecies about the return of Christ. 
there in Revelation. The scroll of Daniel was unsealed by the Lamb <coughs> through the writings of the New Testament. He's the Word that became flesh. And so as he's living his life here on earth, he's unraveling some of the mysteries that Daniel didn't know about. Isn't that amazing? <coughs> it's been argued that the trials and struggles revealed in Daniel's visions are meant to reveal the sufferings of Israel in preparation for the suffering servant, Jesus Christ, who alone brings salvation to his people through his death and resurrection. Because the king and the kingdom prophesied about in Daniel finds its primary interpretation in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So through 12 chapters, Daniel has a message of hope for God's people. Now that may seem odd to many people because many people read Daniel and say, oh, it's such a downer. What a discouraging book. But, but Daniel survives the deportation to Babylon. He survives the reign of four kings. He, he survives the temptation to eat the ceremonially unclean king's food. He survives the crisis of being thrown to the lions. And he even survives the end of the Babylonian Empire as the Persians enter it. Yet Daniel had hope. Look at the last verse. Back to Daniel. Sorry. Told you we'd be all over the place, Daniel. Well, you get ready for one more place before we end. I'll, I'll get there quickly. All right, Daniel 12. Look at this last verse. Verse 13. 12, 13. But go your way till the end. And you shall rest, you shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. It's not just about Daniel's survival or victory. It's about the victory of all of God's people. The same divine messenger says to Daniel, back in verse 10, at that time, your people everywhere whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. And so the small victories that Daniel got to experience gave him hope and confidence for a final deliverance that's yet to come. It's the same for us. The small change grace victories we experience should give us hope. They're a preview. They're a down payment on the final great deliverance that's yet to come for God's people. As Daniel models, obedience to God is essential, uncompromising. Your moral foundation, your declaration of objective truth may be in direct contrast to that of your boss, to that of your neighbor, or even your parents. Don't stand down. It may be dangerous. It sure was for Daniel. But the reward for trusting God is far greater than anything any temporary boss or professor or parent can do to harm. Remember, God is the only permanent king, and his kingdom is worth giving up everything else for. Because his victory is sure. For Christians, we can know God will sustain us. The God who doesn't change has revealed his plan to sustain and preserve his people in him. Isn't that amazing? Not in ritual keeping, not in law keeping, not in trying to check all the boxes to make sure that we've done enough to please him, but simply preserve us in the person and work of Christ. Daniel knew his God was merciful and forgiving, that all God's powers would be used to bring compassion and mercy to his people. Christ's atoning work on the cross made that power and mercy most clear. So for the Israelites of Daniel's day, they couldn't quite see the change in their lives as anything positive. Most people don't think of the word Babylon or exile as something to celebrate. To be exiled to Babylon often meant one was under God's judgment. That was certainly the perspective of 2 Kings or even the book of Lamentation. But those two words, Babylon and exile, I would encourage you, if you're studying along with write those down, put them to memory, because they're two key words for understanding something different that Daniel wants to communicate. It's not a book, it's not a downer book. It's really not. So, so quickly, Babylon, exile. To mention the name Babylon often brings up images of the Tower of Babylon. Remember what happened there? People of earth sought to make a name for themselves. So God's judgment meant that their language would be confused in order to disperse them. Why? Because God had given them a mandate. Be fruitful and fill the earth, not just 
gather up in the city and build a tower to try to make a name for yourself. That wasn't what they were supposed to do. So we can understand why we might think Babylon has negative connotation. Then you get to the end of the Bible. Babylon becomes the preferred term for speaking of God's judgment. The idea of Babylon taking a negative connotation can be traced to Psalm 137.1, verses 8 and 9. The psalmist mentions Babylon as doomed to be destroyed. But we've got to go over to Jeremiah, just a couple chapters. I mean, go, go over to Babylon. Because I want you to see something. Jeremiah 29. Because here, I want us to see why the negative perception of Babylon isn't wrong, but it's not complete. 29. Look, here, here we go. 29, 1 through 7. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the Queen Mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisa, the son of Shaphan, and Demariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, so here's this letter. Get this. This, this is talking about what Daniel's living out right now. Well, not right this very minute in the context of the book. Verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. You see what's happening here? God intended good things for the city of Babylon. God wanted his people to settle in, make Babylon their home, live in such a way that sought the welfare of the city. God wanted his people to pray for Babylon's welfare because he intends to bless it while his people are there. So while many of Daniel's contemporaries had a negative view of Babylon, Daniel didn't. Remember how the book of Jonah showed us a side of God that even Jonah didn't like? Go where, God? I don't think so. They're mean, mean, awful, awful, awful people. There's no way we can save them. Not true. That's sort of what's happening here. Just like God wanted the Ninevites to repent, Daniel's doing the same thing, showing us a different side of God. While Israel did have to go to Babylon for judgment, God was using it for a greater purpose. He was settling his people there, instructing them to plant trees, settle down, make me a priority so that the people of Babylon might have hope. It's just that we asked about for the main ones, too. They live in such a way they reveal to them that their king, as great and powerful as he might have been, was not ultimate. Only God as king and only his kingdom whose fulfillment is found in Christ is ultimate. What I hope this does for us is help us see that Daniel isn't just a book of amazing stories. It's a book about a man and his friends whose unwillingness to compromise living for God in a culture that wants nothing to do with God so that it will help us who live in a culture that wants nothing to do with God recognize that God has us right where he wants us on mission for the glory of his name. Avalon, exile. Second word. It's even shorter. Exile. Church lives in relative freedom here in the West. I get that. Yes, we do. We have been. But even though that's true, we've been exiled since the fall. We were placed out of the garden by God's grace, and we've been exiled in one sense from the presence of God that we were intended to have from the beginning. And so the book of Daniel offers us a different perspective on exile. While they were exiled from the promised land, God wants to use their exile in Babylon to point them to a greater kingdom with a restored relationship with the Father, which is their true home. 
Back a couple pages, Jeremiah 24, just so you know. Just, it starts about good and bad figs. I won't even read it all. You, you read it later today. But it talks about these good and bad figs. And I, and I hope that it gives you a different perspective on the exile. Because guess what? Jeremiah says, look, there's two baskets of figs. One bad, and it's really bad. And one good, and it's really good. And you would think in your mind, oh, well, the people in Jerusalem must be the good figs. And the people in exile must be the bad figs. Wrong. Jeremiah says that's wrong. He says the good figs are the ones that are over in exile because I put them there for a greater purpose of restoration. And the bad figs are those people who hung around in Jerusalem and thought that because they were in Jerusalem, they were the good ones. They were the bad ones. Isn't that interesting? Daniel wants to help us see that God's people in exile, in Babylon, are to be truly counted as God's blessed people. And to find oneself living in Babylon was exactly in the center and purpose of what God wanted to accomplish. For you and I, this broken, sinful world is not our home. Paul says our citizenship is in heaven, and from there we're expecting a Savior. Our salvation is not going to come from who we vote for in our elections this year. This is an election year. It's a big deal. I'm not downplaying that. It's a big deal, but it's not ultimate. While we are living in exile, we're to seek the good of our community. We're to stand up for biblical values in the marketplace. We're to defend the widow and the orphan. We're to care for the marginalized. Israel's change to Babylon's exiles had a great redemptive purpose. And the book of Daniel is meant to help us see that. And so as we walk through this book, may we know that no matter what changes we go through this year, God's victory is sure. God's blessing is on those who see him as king and choose to live for his kingdom. If you're here today and you haven't found your greatest joy in Christ, may you humble yourself like King Neb did. Listen, he got to the point where he was praising God. God who lives forever. He says, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. And so as the book of Daniel helps us kind of understand Babylon and exile, Pray that you would move us to live where you've placed us on mission for you. And that we would be thankful for that. Maybe our home situation isn't great. Maybe we don't love our neighborhood. Maybe, maybe that's difficult for some. Maybe the job isn't exactly what we thought it would be, we want out. Maybe the school situation isn't what we had hoped. Would you remind us, God, that you have us where you have us for a purpose? Thank you for pulling back the curtains sometimes and showing us what our future holds. May that give us hope and strength to press on into a year that's surely to be a challenge for God's people. May we not see, cease to give gratitude to the God who is the one true king and, his, and whose kingdom is eternal. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Church family, would you stand with us? I pray that this time together today, the whole time would move you to want to see God as supreme in your life. And to be able to say with gratitude the joy of living for Him as we continue to worship.